Okay. Um, once again, uh, give you an opportunity before I begin my lecture uh, for anyone here to ask any questions that they might have about any of the material. If you have questions about the film, we should wait, of course, because uh, we're going to uh, cover this film today. But if there are any questions from any of the preceding material, you will get your papers back today at the end of class. Uh, but any questions that anyone has about any of the material uh, that we've covered or questions you might have, by the way, about uh, the final exam? You know, uh, do you have some sense of what you might get on the exam? Yes? Yeah, that's right. You, the, so the exam is, all, is purely in essay format. Uh, there are no ID questions or anything of that kind also, uh, of that kind. Um, and uh, the questions will cover everything that on the syllabus. You're responsible for all the readings, uh, even if they've not been discussed in class, obviously, because it's not possible to discuss all the readings. Uh, but um, if you recall what we did on Tuesday, uh, the Gan Pandey reading, for example, which I mentioned to you. I mean, you know, if I talk about a reading, I think that's a sign to you that it's of some importance, probably. So, you know, you just have to take some, some cues from there. Uh, but the questions will be framed very broadly. Uh, you're unlikely to get a question uh, which would be, let's say, let's say we were looking at the femme divar, it's very unlikely you would get a question which would ask you what is the nature of the dispute between Vijay and Ravi. You know, you're not going to get a question like that. But you might get a question which might ask you uh, to look at the film Dharamputra uh, and remember, all the films are available to you until the end of exam week, until, until the Friday of exam week. And therefore, when you get questions, you're going to have to go to the website and you're going to have to look up those films and find the scenes which might help you answer that question. So if, I, if you got a question, in what respects does Dharamputra, the film, that we're going to look at today, in what respects does it offer an anti-communal argument? I, I, I'm putting it in very simple terms. You wouldn't get it in such simple terms. It will probably be something more like uh, how one might one possibly think of Dharamputra as a film that is both anti-communal and secular. And if it is secular, how does that differ from your understanding of secularism derived from your understanding of the Western experience of secularism, right? Because I think you will agree, for those of you who have seen the film, that its idea of secularism is not the idea of secularism of the French Republic, for example, right? That's very clear. There's no notion of separation of church and state that the film is invoking at all. So, and then if you do get a question like that, what would you be expected to do? You'd be expected to obviously use a couple of the readings, and then you go to the film and you identify the scenes and show how those scenes will help you answer that question. That's what you would do, you know, right? Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, if you get a film about Lagan, the film, the question may be about Lagan. For those of you who have come in late, we're just talking about what the shape of the final exam so you can start thinking a little bit about it. But if, if you do get a question, it may be a question about Lagan, or it may be a question about cricket and nationalism, or it may be a question about anti-colonial resistance, and what are the particular ways in which we can read Lagan as an anti-colonial film. But is its anti-colonialism really setting up simply a dichotomy between the colonizer and the colonized? And then how would you complicate it? You would complicate it by saying that yes, it may be doing that, and then you give illustrations, but it is also suggesting that there were forms of colonization within Indian society, and it's also suggesting that there were forms of colonization within British society. For example, Elizabeth is colonized by her brother. And of course, that means that women were colonized. English women were colonized too. Now, they may not have been colonized in the same way in which Indian 
men and Indian women were, but they were colonized. So I'm going to expect something along those lines. Yes. Sorry, once again? Yes, I'm guiding you because I'm giving you the question. Whereas in the case of the paper, you have to come up with the paper in a way is actually more difficult because you have to come up with an argument yourself, right? Uh, the, whereas in the exam, the question prompts the argument already, you know? It, but the questions are not going to be Mickey Mouse questions, I can assure you. I mean, you're going to have to think a little bit about the material. That's because that's what it is. It's an, it's an essay exam. But you have choice. That's what you have to really think about. So if there's a question or two that you find too difficult to tackle, and, and when I give you the questions, I'm not going to say that you, you must answer questions one and two. I have done that before where I say you have to answer two questions, number one and two, and then out of the remaining six, you answer two. No, this time you'll just get eight and you answer four, which I think is, you know, very generous. Uh, when I was growing up, we never used to get choice. We never used to get study guides. This is all... Uh, you know, uh, where education has gone now. Uh, I, I mean, in India, I can tell you the idea that you would get a study guide, it was unthinkable because the examiner would say, what the hell am I examining you about if I'm giving you a study guide? The, you, everything's, you study everything that's on the syllabus, as simple as that. You know, all right, so, but you get choice. And so, uh, you know, you can always do Russian roulette and decide that there are four films that you're never going to see, uh, you know, uh, uh, or you know you're not going to do half the readings, and you're just going to hope that you can get by with the rest of them. That that's you you can take that risk if you want. Any other questions about anything thus far? All right. So since I'm on this subject, let me try to see if I can get a response from you. Uh, I gave a very extended argument on Tuesday about what is communalism, and I think I explained it systematically, step by step. You know, what are the building blocks for what we might describe as the formation of an ideology of communalism in India? Okay, so w w what uh, would anyone here tell me um, what you understand now that I've described it to you, now that you've seen the film, and you can see very clearly that we can speak also about Hindu communalism and we can speak about Muslim communalism. So now we're we're extending it argument a little bit further, by, by which I mean that a Hindu communalist is always thinking predominantly of Hindu identity, Hindu interests, a Hindu conception of the nation, just as a Muslim communalist is thinking of Muslim identity, Muslim self-interest, how to advance the interests of your own particular community. And of course the question is, why is it that people begin to think along those lines? How did religion become the fault line? So remember that partly the whole idea of communalism is based on the assumption that in India, religion is always the fault line. It always is. Before anything else is, religion is. It's divisive. So uh, this, in light of this film and in light of the readings, if you got a question about communalism, what, is, what, do you, what do you understand? The question may simply be, what do you understand by communalism and the communalist interpretation of Indian history? What would you say? Anyone? What do you understand by the communalist interpretation of Indian history? Just take a stab at it. Yeah, Michael. Their his, the history of India is played out through the kind of intersection of populations that identify primarily with their religious affiliation. According to this mode of interpreting the Indian the, past. Yes. This mode of, we have to be always sure that we are not describing that reality. The, com the communalists, uh, communalists think they're describing that reality, right? But there's no necessary relationship but between what is on the ground, okay, 
and the nature of the communalist interpretation. So let me give you a different, interp different example, different illustration of the communalist interpretation of Indian history. And I'm picking this example uh, because this is a course on nationalism. So in the, uh, in the late 17th century, there was a figure, uh, I know a couple of you will recognize that name at least, maybe a few more of you might. His name is Shivaji. Okay? So Shivaji is, an, is a 17th century Indian uh, uh, guerrilla fighter. Okay? You know, I, so I had to search for the word. Uh, because if I said if he's a 17th century Indian nationalist, that poses a problem. Why does it pose a problem? Because then we are assuming that nationalism began in India in the 17th century. I don't think he was a nationalist at all. That's how he's shown today. So today he's shown as a nationalist. So very briefly, so you understand, so India at that point is under, Mughal, the, under the Mughal Empire. The, in the emperor of India at that time is the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb. All right? Um, that's the emperor of India at that point, Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb has been cast in the last 300 years as a terrible Muslim communalist. In other words, he did not rule according to the communalist interpretation. He did not rule as an Indian ruler. He ruled as a Muslim ruler. He ruled as a Muslim ruler. Right? So they, we, we don't even have to go to Shivaji. We could simply take Aurangzeb and I could show you the communalist interpretation. I've given you one illustration here already. The communalist interpretation of Indian history would emphasize looking at Aurangzeb not as an Indian ruler but as a Muslim ruler. That may or may not be true. Okay? It may or may not be true, and it sees a very controversial figure. But what is very clear is that the opposition to him came from a number of different places. One of the main sources of opposition, in fact, the, the figure who is the iconic opponent of Aurangzeb is Shivaji. So Shivaji is a person who pioneers guerrilla warfare in India, in Western India. And there are all kinds of legends. Now, so the first thing that the popular historians did and what happened in the public imagination was to turn Shivaji into a figure of Indian nationalism. And I'm suggesting there's already a problem there because that suggests that Shivaji was thinking of an Indian nation state. All right? And that nationalism was something on the platter in the 17th century. It wasn't. Shivaji was opposed to Aurangzeb, he was opposed to him for lots of reasons. You could be opposed to, for example, someone who's a tyrannical ruler, but religion may or may not enter into the question. It may or may not. When we say that Aurangzeb was, for example, a Muslim ruler, or when historians say that he ruled as a Muslim ruler, why is that actually controversial, or why is it that I myself would not fully accept that argument? Because I know that the historical record shows very clearly that 35% of all the senior officials that he appointed were Hindus. Why did he appoint that many Hindus? For example, you could argue. Right? So forth and so on. This is not the time to get into a long detailed discussion of Aurangzeb. I'm simply giving you an illustration. Now Aurang Shivaji opposes him because he sees Aurangzeb as an interloper. He sees him as someone who has encroached upon his territories, right? and he offers resistance. And what happens in the 19th century, late 19th century, when nationalism starts to become an important force, the Hindus begin to look for figures in the past who can now become celebrated as great figures of Hindu resistance to foreign rule. And now Shivaji is going to be put in that template. Now in the late 19th century, he is going to be elevated as a great Hindu ruler. Right? And there are questions about that. Really, did he think of himself really always as a Hindu, for example? Right? What was the composition of his armies? To what extent was he practitioner of Hindu rituals? So forth and so on. That's 
what I mean when I talk about the communalist interpretation of the Indian past. In other words, what the communal minded historians did was, and the communal minded public, educated public, was the beginning of the late 19th century, they began to interpret Indian history and the Indian past in religious categories. Okay? That's what you have to think about. And of course, Gan Pandey has a very sophisticated argument, some elements of which we looked at the other day. All right? So I hope it's clear to you. Um, and I can, I'm, I'm giving you a friend, more than a friendly hint. You'll definitely get one question on communalism out of the eight. Okay? So you should really make sure that you attempt to understand. And luckily for you, the lectures are also available uh, on Bruin Cast, so you can go back and sort of you know, look, look at that material. So now, this film that we're looking at, Dharam Putra. So Dharam is, you know, I mean, I, I sort of indicate in the syllabus that you could roughly translate it as Putra is son. Putri would be daughter. Uh, the, so son of religion, which is, in English, it sounds completely cranky and nonsensical, son of religion. What does that mean, you know? All right, so it's not quite an accurate translation. And dharam cannot easily be translated actually into religion. Okay, it can be translated into it only because of conventions that have arisen in recent decades and because the idea is that every country, every civilization has religion. I'm not actually sure about that because the idea of religion is really a European idea, by which I mean that in all civilizations, people have some relationship to the divine, some notion of a supreme being, some notion of the transcendent. You know, even people who are called pagans or animists, they have some notion of the divine, the transcendent, for the obvious reason that if you're on this earth, sometimes you think to yourself, well, how did this all begin? Yeah, you could, you could be a scientist and say, yeah, I'll tell you Big Bang Theory, you know, explains everything. No, it doesn't. Because why do we think about the divine, the transcendent? Why do people go and offer prayers? And you could say 99% of the time it's for purely selfish reasons, you know. Uh, you know, they want some rewards. There's somebody sick in the family. They want that person to get better. They want their daughter to get admitted to Berkeley or Harvard. So, you know, let me offer a prayer. Uh, you know, they want to do well in business, whatever, right? But you understand that there is some notion of this. However, religion, here the problem, and I'm really talking about this now because the major character in this film, uh, the young, played by the young Shashi Kapoor, who of course plays Ravi in Divar. Same character and same director, by the way. All right, same director, Yash Chopra. Um, this is 1961, Divar is 1975, so it's 14 years apart, but you can see some similarities there as well in, in various ways. Uh, even the metaphor of the wall, actually. I mean, if you think about it, because they put a bridge between the two homes, you know, they, and, and in the last scene, uh, the last scene, they're all standing on the bridge, the bridge of harmony, bridging the gap between the two communities. And that's where, you know, it just gets a little too, for someone of my tastes, uh, it's just too easy, the symbolism, you know. Uh, but, but it's there. You know, they're all standing on that bridge, all right? Uh, I mean, they're almost looking like politicians about to inaugurate the bridge, actually, at the last scene, you know? So now the thing is that if you're thinking about religion, this character, you see, he has a certain idea of Hinduism. Where did he derive this idea from? I'm not saying, by the way, that, that I expect you to know, and of course these are all inferences and interpretations that one makes, but if I ask myself, you know, what is his understanding of Hinduism? Where did he derive it from? What I want to suggest to you 
is that he derived his understanding of Hinduism from colonial texts about India. That's where he derived his understanding of Hinduism from. By which I mean that his idea of, you know, the Vedas. What are the Vedas? Okay. For example, the Vedas. No Indian reads the Veda. No Hindu reads the Vedas. Not only because they're written in Sanskrit, which is not read by the vast majority of India's population. I mean, there was a time in school when I remember when I was, you still had to learn Sanskrit for two, three years. You know, you had to do it and then you gave it up. You know, and, and now they don't even bother actually in most schools because they understand if the choice is between a computer language and Sanskrit, everyone's going to go for the computer language. You know, you're not going to be getting too many jobs in sans learning Sanskrit, right? And of course, this is a job-oriented sort of student population uh, everywhere in the world. Right? But the fact of the matter is that the Veda does not occupy in Hinduism the relationship that the Quran does in Islam. In, if you're a Muslim, you're supposed to know the Quran. And you know it. You might know nothing else. That's the problem for men often. You know nothing else except that. You know, sometimes. Right? But you know the Quran. Or, and, and, and here not we're even getting into the nuances of what it means to know it. What do, they, what do people really know? How do they interpret a passage that may be not so clear? Right? But you, you understand the gist of what I'm saying. Much in the way in which you say that, that, that the Bible and in particular the New Testament, that this is a work that is meant to be read by Christians. The Veda is not meant to be read by anyone. Anyone in India. And there are whole categories of people who are not even supposed to read it because for them to read it is to contaminate the text. You know, right? So we'd have to say that, you know, when he talks about the Vedas and all of that, we have to say, where does he derive his understanding of Hinduism from? And this is all in the background. What I'm, it, this, it's, it's not that you, you, know, you would be expected to understand this. I'm helping you, trying, trying to help you understand the character, really, and where he's coming from. All right? there, there is a more immediate context that he's communal-minded, but there is a deeper context there, which is what I'm trying to explicate before we get to some of the scenes. That deeper context is that when the Europeans came to India, and here in particular I'm thinking of the British. I mean the Portuguese had come to India as well, the Dutch. But I'm thinking of the British because the British are the ones who consolidated the rule in India and then India fell under British rule. That beginning in the late 18th century, these Europeans began to read these texts. There were very few Europe, Britishers who could read these texts because they were in Sanskrit. And then of course the few who acquired a knowledge sometimes sought to translate the text. So the translations of these texts begins in the late 18th century. And when I say texts, I'm referring to a great many texts. So I just give you, uh, as an, uh, uh, if I had to just write down the names of, so when I talk about the Vedas, so you have the Rig Veda, uh, and then you have the Atharva Veda, Yajur Veda, all of these. We don't need to get that, but this is the, the most well-known of the four Vedas. Then you have texts such as, for example, the Upanishads, and then you have a text which is called the Manu Smriti. Manu Smriti means the law code uh, of uh, Manu. So Manu is the lawgiver in which Moses, in the same way in which Moses is the lawgiver, all right? And so on, just, just as an illustration. Now here's the first problem. The first problem is that the Europeans did not, had not ever encountered anything like what we now know as Hinduism before. It was not part of their experience. The, what they did understand was the world of Christianity, to some extent the world of Islam, because of earlier contacts between Islam and the world of Christianity. And to some extent, of course, they understood the world of Judaism, for obvious reasons, the whole Judeo-Christian tradition. Hinduism, Buddhism, all of this, Jainism, this was far outside their arena of experience. Okay. Now, 
in the late 18th century, in Europe itself, there was a concerted attempt to try to determine the final text of the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is called German Biblical Criticism, High German Biblical Criticism. Because you have to remember, for example, uh, you don't have to know any of the New Testament at all to understand what I'm saying. But if you look at what are called the Synoptic Gospels, right? So you're looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke. Jesus himself never wrote anything. Right? I think, you all, I think all of you know that. Jesus himself never wrote anything. The founders of religions often do not write anything at all. The Buddha himself never wrote anything. But there are many, many things that he said which are captured by disciples and so forth. And that's where the problems begin because then someone else is recording or capturing that. And then, of course, we don't know whether they captured it accurately, what was the time gap between the time that they captured it and what the Buddha said. Similar questions arose, for example, with respect to what Christ had meant to say. You know, right? When Christ says that it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what exactly did he mean? Right? Of course, none of the rich people here take that seriously at all, because if they did, they wouldn't be rich to begin with, and they certainly wouldn't be filthy rich, you know, right? But the, Jesus says that. That's, it's, in, it's in the New Testament, the exact words, right? So th then the, the, what was biblical criticism attempting to do? It was trying to determine the final text, because you get variations sometimes, okay? And with respect to the New Testament and the Old Testament, in comparison to Indian texts, it was a piece of cake, in comparison. The problem in India was acute. However, when I say problem, it was never a problem to the Indians themselves. It was only a problem to the Europeans. What do I mean by that? That, let's say you have a text like the Rig Veda, now remember, this is all recorded in the oral tradition. It is transmitted orally. And the first, the text is dated back to approximately 1500 BCE. That's the approximate date of this text. But the first manuscript is only seven, eight hundred years old, let's say. And then you find that there are 50 different manuscripts and these manuscripts differ in fundamental respects on some points. Now when the Europeans get there, they go crazy. They say, which of these is authentic? Because their view is there has to be an authentic text. And their view is that the Brahmins are this cunning, conniving lot. As they are in kind of Anand's essay, if I may put it this way. This cunning, conniving Lord who are trying to disguise things and they're deliberately fooling people. So, you know, you don't know what really is the authentic text. This quest to find an authentic text is very much a European way of thinking about this text. And of course, it's assuming, it's making so many assumptions. This is a very, this, all this is quite complex because if they're also assuming that a text is central to a religion, but it may not be. That is that most Hindus, for example, do not go by the text, if you ask me. Right? My mother, who is reasonably well educated, by the standards of her time, she is certainly quite well educated. You know, a woman who, uh, you know, is now in her mid-80s and uh, grew up in the 30s, 40s, uh, but she, has she read the Upanishads or the Rig Veda or the Manusmriti? Of course not. None of these texts has been read by anyone of her generation, you know, or even your generation, unless they happen to be scholars or they get assigned it in History 175C, you know. All right? You know, nobody reads these texts. I'm, I'm talking about people who practice the religion. It's no relationship there. We'll, we'll have to take it later. Just, okay? So, what is happening here? What is happening here is that 
the Europeans had an idea what a religion is. By the late 18th century, they had fixed a definition. That definition was that there was only one true religion. Which one? Come on, come on. Don't, no, no. Just say it. Yeah? Too vague. What kind of Christianity? Lutheranism. You, well, that's too specific. Protestant. Protestant Christianity. Protestant Christianity. That is a true religion. So you say Christianity? No. Do you know the pastor who three days ago was one of the two pastors sent by the United States for the inauguration of the American, new American embassy in Jerusalem. You read this. I'm not making it up. You read it in, the, in any of the major newspapers. One of the two pastors, he a year ago said at his church in the US, in New England I think, that Catholics are going to burn to hell. They're going to burn. I mean, this sounds like a 15th, 16th century debate. Reformation, counter-reformation. Why? Because according to this Protestant version of Christianity, Catholicism is just as bad as Hinduism. In fact, it might be worse. You know, these popish loving Christians, you know, full of superstition. You know, that's the picture of Catholic Catholicism that comes out of Protestant Christianity. So the perfect religion was Protestant Christianity. There's a Messiah. We know what his teachings are. We don't want any saints, any of that. That's why all the churches are stripped barren. Of course, this goes back to the whole Reformation, Counter-Reformation. Right? It's very clear that this is the model. Now, the problem is in late 18th century India, the Hindus once... India comes under colonial rule. The Hindus who want to begin to modernize, what do they want to do? They want to transform Hinduism into something that will resemble Protestant Christianity. So, for example, we need to have a monotheistic religion. Why do we have, you know, 330 million gods and goddesses? That's what they say, by the way, 330 million gods and goddesses. No one's ever done a census, by the way, <laughs> you know. Um, and I know that there are new ones that are born and old ones that die, you know, okay? Uh, somewhere in India, at this point in time, there is a temple dedicated to Bill Gates, I'm sure, and another one to Steve Jobs, you know. Uh, there'll even be a temple to Donald Trump in time, somewhere in India. Out of the half a million temples, there'll be one. That's the nature of the faith. Now, this was the source of absolute confusion and chaos from the point of view of modernizing Indians. Like, we don't have one single text. We've got so many texts, got billions of gods and goddesses. I mean, they're like the World Wide Web. You know, they just proliferate, right? right? So what do we need to do? We need to create a rational faith. Have a rational teacher at the head of that faith, a historical founder. Hinduism never had a historical founder. Christianity is, has a historical founder. Islam has a historical founder. That's what Muhammad is. Right? Who is the historical founder of Hinduism? There is no historical founder of this religion. And I'm saying to you that Dilip, the main character in this film, Right? In the second half of this film, he, his understanding of Hinduism is exactly this understanding. He, the Hinduism he takes pride in is really a Protestant Christian version of Hinduism. That's what it is. Right? That's how he derived his understanding of that faith. Okay? And so, and of course you see, the opposition comes to him precisely from all the others who have a very different conception of Hinduism and that is however a kind of a humanist understanding you know it, it's a kind of a general humanist liberal sort of view and so this is where you might say that the film poses a few problems because it simply is a simply kind of a liberal 
<laughs> is, it, is it simply the representation of a liberal versus a dogmatist view of religion? You could, could say that could be one possible interpretation. If somebody, let's say, argued that, I would say it's an argument worth taking forward if you can sustain it. Right? Does he simply have, is he simply have a dogmatic view as opposed to his father and mother, right? his adoptive father and mother in particular, who seem to have a much more liberal humanist kind of view. Okay? But let me not say more, let's look at a few scenes now from this film. Okay? Um, and by the way, the beginning of the film uh, has Sare Jahan Se Acha. The same song you heard in the Divar, yeah, um, the bridge. Nineteen twenty five Hindu Muslim Bhai Bhai brothers, Hindus and Muslim, Inkalab Revolution, Long Live Revolution. So just so that you know the chronology, 1925 is of course very much the Gandhian phase of Indian nationalism, right? So this is 22 years before independence, the first big non-cooperation movement. Go, go back to Rangde Basanti, Jallianwala Bagh, 1919, Gandhi starts the non-cooperation movement, 1920, it gets suspended in early 1922. And then, of course, the salt Satyagraha 1930. So this is in between when the problem of communalism hadn't quite yet become the force. That is that there were people. Because, of course, think of it this way. That when people are chanting Hindu Muslim Bhai Bhai, Hindu Muslims are brothers, it means that there are people who don't believe that. You wouldn't have to chant it otherwise. You wouldn't have to chant it otherwise. Why, why does one have to assert this kind of syncretic identity? You have to assert it precisely because communalism is now beginning to rear its ugly head. Right? There are people who are beginning to advocate that, look, can Hindus and Muslims coexist? You know? And when I say, by the way, Hindus and Muslims, please understand me to say, other religious communities too. I don't want to keep on saying the full list every time. Hindu, Muslim, Sikhs, Jains, Buddhists, you know, it's understood. Uh, uh, although the principal conflicts that were going to arise were going to be actually between Hindus and Muslims, you know, all right? But there, but there can be Sikh communalism too, you know, uh, and that was going to be a, a, an issue in, in 1947, you know. Are you, did you have a question quickly? Yeah. yeah. Just Muslims and everyone else, not just everyone else. I mean, I'm saying that when, when we speak about religious uh, harmony, we're thinking about everyone, but it's not that Muslims on one side and then everyone else on the other, no. The, the, the opposition, see, because the Muslims had nothing to say really about the Buddhists or the Jains. They had nothing to say about them because their fundamental concern was to the extent that a person was communal minded, that is they're now thinking of Muslim interest. Why are they thinking of that? Because now that nationalism has become a potent force, the writing is on the wall, by which I mean that some people understood that sooner or later the British were going to be leaving India. If they are leaving India and India becomes an independent nation, what will be the position of all the religious groups in the country. Okay? Most people would use a phrase, what would be the position of religious? Minorities. I always have a little bit reluctance in using that <coughs> word because this way of thinking about communities is a very modern way of thinking. That is thinking about majorities and minorities. Majority, one really only begins to think of majorities and minorities 
in a world of electoral democracy in many ways. Now, you, some of you might be confused. You might be thinking to yourself, well, how can that be true? Isn't it, isn't it empirically true that, for example, historically in any country at any given point in time or in any empire, there were always people who were minorities? Yes, as a demographic fact. As a demographic fact, if I said to you that the Jews were a minority in the Ottoman Empire, as a demographic empirical fact, it is true. But it is not true necessarily if you are looking at the idea of majority and minority as a psychological category. There can be people who can be demographically a minority, but they can have the confidence of a majority. The best example of that in India is the Parsis. Right? The Parsis are Zoroastrians who had come from Iran. When Islam came to Iran, then they fled and they came to India. The Parsis have always been a very small number in India. But they always had the confidence of a people who were like a majority. They never expressed any kind of anxiety living in India. And in fact, I would say this is also true of the Sikhs. The Sikhs are numerically quite small in India. But they never really had any anxieties. 1947 created anxieties, yes, for obvious reasons. The whole partition of the Punjab, all of that. But the Sikhs always had a confidence about them. They never played out the psychological role of a minority, you see. Whereas, if you look at Hindu nationalism in India today, the Hindus who constitute 79% of the population, the middle class Hindus there, they are always complaining about how well other religious minorities are being treated by the Indian state. Which means that they sort of act as though they were the minority. I mean, that's the problem of Hindu nationalism, if in, a, in a nutshell today. That the Hindus who constitute an overwhelming percentage of the population really kind of act as though they are being besieged, you know, by everyone else. So this is my reluctance in speaking about majority and minority. This is a very modern kind of political arithmetic which has now become universalized. Okay? So, and, and I think the film, by the way, is a very good reflection. This period, 1925, although I'm reading it in a very nuanced way because I'm saying to you that in 1925, and certainly in the years before that, many of the Muslims did not feel as though there was any thing they had to really think about as Muslims. That whatever problems they had were the problems that others had. That you are you're subjected to colonial rule, if you are a, a worker, you are a landless peasant. It's not that you are a Muslim which is necessarily the most overwhelming fact of your life. It's a fact that you are working class or you are a peasant or you are dispossessed. But by 1925, this period of Gandhian nationalism that we are looking at, that's the phase. Okay? All of these people, they're really chanting, so to speak, in the name of Gandhi. You know, Hindu, Muslim, Bhai, Bhai. This slogan of brotherhood. You know? okay? This was all kind of in the Gandhian phase. And yet I'm suggesting to you that, of course, it was only necessary because clearly there were some people now who had veered to the idea that Muslims are one community, Hindus are another community, and their interests do not coincide. You know, okay? Motherland, you see how often it appears in so many films here. एक ही है, एक ही है, एक ही है। हिंदू बदरमान भाई भाई, 
और दोनों अपने वतन के लिए मरने के लिए बदल जाए ओके सो द फिल्म इस्टैब्लिश इज दिस and and you could say that this is both an illustration of the anti communalism that the film is promoting you could also speak of this as secularism if you wanted to right and i've already outlined for you that the indian notion of secularism doesn't quite this work the same way uh, and i'm not sure by the way that that would be the best term here. i would describe this more as a kind of a pluralism the idea the notion of india as a pluralistic civilization um, where all these different streams and strands can be uh, accommodated all right now let's move to another clip uh, and again of course i'm not describing the plot because i'm assuming that all of you have seen the film now so you know what's happened here right in the in the in, in that uh, um uh the old man uh and and uh, uh his daughter uh, mano they kind of go on a uh um, journey through india through india okay uh let, let's just go back for a second so here you see that you know, this is so it, it, this is very interesting because this is one of the first times in hindi cinema that you see what you might describe as a map of muslim pilgrimage so they are going to all these different muslim pilgrimage spots you don't see that often in commercial hindi cinema right that's what they're doing they go from one you know mosque and or one mausoleum uh you know the major muslim sites that's what's really happening here okay um now let's listen to and that that little ep episode which i just sh we're going to get back to it now but that singing that's called qawali it's a qawali so this is done by groups uh of men and sometimes there is a there is a sawal jawab sawal jawab is a question answer so one group will say something the other will respond and they go back and forth this is a particular style there was a fantastic exponent of it who died about uh 20 years ago nusrat fateh ali khan i mean if you've never heard his music just go and listen to it it is mesmerizing you know okay although there are some people who argue that they're better traditional qawals than he was i don't want to get into that but anyhow this is this is that kind of singing so we're going to we want to listen to a little bit to to what they're saying as well um so there you can see right so this is a su super imposition there and of short and you can see the basically it's that pilgrimage muslim map as i'm calling it of india that you're really seeing over here and i think it's interesting to ask i mean you know 1961 um see a film like this would not be possible today it would not be possible today because this is a mainstream hindi film and it's very comfortable in displaying this muslim world as well it's very comfortable you can see that right i mean it's not there's no real anxiety there uh, it would be very hard to to do that today if, given the kind of strident hindu nationalism which has become so common in india in recent years but 1961 jawaharlal nehru was still alive he's still the prime minister of india he stands for a resolute kind of secularism you know and this is of course four years before the war with pakistan there was a war with pakistan in 1965 then another war in 1971 but i'm saying to you that the film has a kind of a sensibility that is very difficult to capture in film today in cinema today we will just one minute of this qawali just a couple of lines read the subtitles I I have to make sure you understand because some of you probably don't. Uh what is kashi? Yeah. Banaras. Okay? 
uh, the city is also known as Varanasi. Um, between the two ghats of Varuna and Assi, okay, that's Varanasi, and uh, Banaras is the colloquial term that is used, and Kashi means what? What does Kashi mean? City of light. City of light. Okay. Some people th now, some people think of it as equivalent to the Mecca. Okay, to Mecca for Muslims. No, because Banaras or Kashi is a Shaivite city. It's not a Vaishnava city. So, so a lot of Va for, Vaish for Vaishnavas, it may not be the supreme city, but for Shaivites, it may be, but not for Vaishnavas. You know, and this is why I think that it is very difficult to try to find an analog, okay, for Mecca or for Jerusalem. You know, you cannot, frankly. However, of course, the the artist can can take that license and just simply look at Kashi as a city for Hindus, all Hindus, whether they're Vaishnavas or Shaktos or Shaivites or Tantrics. You know, doesn't really matter. You know, right? And Kaaba, of course, is the Kaaba is the that big black monolithic structure, right, in Mecca, right, around which Muslims circumambulate, right? So, so the the wording is important here because he's saying, call it Kaaba or Kashi, it's one and the same thing, right? These are holy places. So we call, just as we call God by different names, right? Similarly, the whole idea of this Kavali is to suggest a certain kind of syncretism. That, you know, different adherents of different religions have their different sites. But the question is, you know, can we still speak of one God. Can we still speak of the idea that, well, yes, the divine is the same everywhere, no matter how we apprehend the divine. And by what name we call the divine, you know, right? <laughs> Call God Ram or Rahim. That's just the Wi Fi. Yeah. For Muslims, and that's for Hindus. Believe this or believe that makes no difference. Okay, I think you get the idea, right? That's sort of the general spirit. Now, now a couple of smaller scenes. For example, and this is where you think about Mr. and Mrs. Ayer, the, the, the bottle scene, as I call it. Okay, just that 10 second clip is good enough because, of course, I mean, uh, she's saying um, Savitri, uh, devout Hindu woman on the right, that's Bano, uh, Muslim woman on the left, and uh, Savitri says, well, you know, I'll only eat, you know, when you eat, and so we're going to eat from the same plate, and Bano is really kind of a little surprised, you know, how, you, are you sure you want to do that? You're a Hindu woman. So let me, let me also explain a couple more things which are quite important, okay? Um, if, for example, I showed you this little clip, would you be inclined to reach, and if you were, that would be perfectly fine. Would you be incri inclined to reach the conclusion that this shows that there is more bigotry on the Hindu side? Because remember, also in Mr. and Mrs. Ayer, think back, right? That Raja, who's a Muslim, 
I mean, to the extent that he has a religious affinity. I don't think he's very much of a religious bloke, frankly. You know, right? I mean, he kind of presents himself as a secular, liberal, you know, wildlife photographer, you know, right? Uh, I mean, can't really think of him as a religious man. But, but yes, to the extent that if the, the communal view would be impossible to say he doesn't have a religion. If he's an Indian, he has a religion. Just scratch the surface and even the most ardent communist, there's a religion behind it. You know, right? And uh, yes, and then we know he's a Muslim. You know, right? And, but, but he doesn't have any problems with, you know, whether Mrs. Ayer Minakshi drinks from the same bottle, whether she touches the bottle, the problem is all on her side. And similarly here, what do we find? That Bano is saying to Savitri, are you sure you want to do this? Right? So now you see wh wh why I ask the question this way. Because I think if you are sort of looking at it from the point of view of a modern sensibility, which I'm assuming all of you have, right? Okay. Uh, then you think to yourself, hey, you know, there's a kind of a bigotry here. But the bigotry always seems to be on the Hindu side. Right? Isn't that a reasonable conclusion? I know some of you are all thinking there's some trick here. You know. <laughs> yes, Aditya, and then I'll come to you. Yeah. Um, so, from, from my perspective. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. How would you rather say that it's, it's on the other side? Because uh, if you look at it that way, like, it's, it's Bono who's pointing out the fact, right? Because um, Savitri, who's a Hindu woman, she's already been doing it. And the, the, the idea. Uh -huh. of the, two, the two sides strikes the Muslim woman first in the first place. So, like, I mean, how for me personally, I'm seeing it the other way around. Okay, that's I I I will grant you the that possibility of that interpretation certainly, but of course, wouldn't you say that the reason why Bano has to point it out all is, is precisely because there is that subtext there, and that subtext there is that look. You know, I want to make sure, she's saying to Savitri, that you're not violating your own religious beliefs by eating with me, you know, right? So, mm, mm, you're saying that, uh, you know, in a way, curiously, what the scene suggests is, is a, we don't know what to be, whether we want to call it bigotry on the part of Bano, I think that may be probably putting it too strongly, but that she's perhaps being overcautious about it that she's assuming that every Hindu actually adheres to that code, right? And maybe she shouldn't be making that assumption. Would that be a safe way of, yeah? That's what I was Yeah, okay. All right, uh, Anuba, and then I'll come to you, Anya. Yeah. I was just going to answer the larger question of, like, does it seem like there's bigotry on, on part of the Hindus? And I think that, like, the Yeah. In, like just because the country is primarily Hindu, imagine having a Muslim, like imagine having a movie in which the Muslims are putting down the Hindus, like you know that that would be, would like create genuine riots in India, right? So I just think that within such, you know, uh, public cinema, it's just more acceptable to, for the Hindus to speak from this, because I, I feel like, I mean, especially Brahmins, like, like they're white people of India, right? Like they have... Almost, <laughs> you know, um, they, they enjoy those kind of uh, sort of social yeah. reverence or social benefits. And, and yes. so, as a Hindu, I can say, yeah, Hindus do blah, blah. But if I was a Muslim and I said that about Hindus yeah. um, in India, I mean, that would put me in a dangerous situation. Yeah. So I just think that it's, it's more commonly depicted that way because it's more politically correct to do it that way. No, but, but the only problem with that reading is that actually, empirically speaking, a Muslim doesn't have any problem eating with a Hindu. That's empirically the fact. Doesn't at all. The reason they don't is because this idea of, for example, contamination doesn't exist. Whatever the problems th that any religion has and whatever the problems Islam has, I can certainly tell you that in this context, this idea that you can't eat with some such, such and such person, such and such group, this is an idea that Muslims don't have. And this is an idea that Sikhs don't have either. 
In fact, that is one reason why the whole institution of Langar became one of the chief marks of Sikhism. Because what is that institution? For those of you who don't know it, right? Uh, that institution is where you go to a Gurdwara, a, a place of Sikh worship, and when they serve a meal, no questions are asked. Who you are, where you have come from, you all sit in one row, or you sit in rows, irrespective. Hindus can't dream of it. Can't dream of it. Impossible. So, so no, I mean, there is an empirical fact that, that, that is important here. Anya. Well, I was just going to say in terms of bigotry, I, don't, I, I see how from a modern sense it does seem bigoted to yeah. have that tradition, but when I think of Hinduism in general, yeah. um, and especially certain strains of it and certain followers of it who are very devout, there are yeah. all these little superstitions and traditions that are very ingrained into the religion or in their version of the religion. Yeah. That's yeah. what I think of when I see all of these. Yeah, I wouldn't want to call them superstitions because, because superstition is always a, uh, uh, always, always, without exception. So, so the minute you say superstitions, we've made a judgment about what these are. Okay, yeah, what these conventions are. You, you understand, right, what I mean, okay? Uh, yes, Carol. I was going to say, this is an example of stereotyping. Yeah. Yeah. Even though Sabrina has already offered. Yeah. yeah. So it's like expecting you belong to that group, you must subscribe to every you must you must subscribe to everything that, that group Yes. So you see there is something anomalous about the scene because after all, if Sav Savitri has taken Bano's son, right? That's the anomalous nature of the scene here if she's taken her son and is now raising her son as her own son, raising Bano's son as her own son, then obviously you would say that she has already crossed any kind of threshold that you can think of, right? So then what is there in sharing a meal together at that juncture? Why Bano should assume, and this is exactly what, what Savitri will say to Bano, that look, I mean, you know, when I'm, after all, I'm, the, the son I'm raising is your own as my own, then w why should you think that I would have any problem in eating with you? But you see, this is where, this is a matter of enormous subtlety. Uh, these are things that you will not be, and I will not question you about this, by the way, because these are kind of cult nuances which are very hard to capture, particularly for people who are completely outside that domain. I, let me explain this just a bit further, okay? Um, because you see, when we think about things like religion, religious identity, communalism, you shouldn't simply be thinking of mega structures. Oh, these are the people who read the Quran, and these are the people who read the Veda, or listen to the Veda. You know, these are the people who go to a mosque, these are people who go to a temple. Those are the mega structures by which you make these distinctions. These distinctions are very often made at very small levels and commensality who you eat with and who you don't eat with has always been a mark of signification of division the idea in the deep south american deep south that a negro i'm using the word that was used at that time of course you know that that a negro could sit down on the same table as the white man and eat at the same table didn't exist either. Didn't. But this is even more complex here. When you read the narratives of partition, this is wonderful book that I teach, written by Urvashi Butalia, The Other Side of Silence, which are these oral narratives about the partition. Many of the Muslims who were interviewed in these oral histories and asked, you know, why they thought the partition had happened, why the country being divided, and all of that. Many of them, some would say things like, well, you know, the Hindus, they wouldn't eat with us. We felt, we felt shunned, we felt contaminated, we felt outcasted. That, you know, there were relations between us and other Hindus in the village, but, but you could never eat with them. 
And, and a friend of mine pointed out, absolutely correct, he is, that the only difficulty with that argument is that, that most Hindus would not eat with other Hindus either. It's not just that they wouldn't eat with Muslims. They wouldn't eat with most other Hindus. Because, because they're very strict rules. This is all, of course, among people who now adhere to a kind of an orthodox conception. Because many of these rules have obviously dissolved in urban settings among so-called educated liberals. Uh, I say so-called because, again, you know, they may be liberal in some respects, but they may not be liber liberal in other respects. We never know. Uh, but they wouldn't. There are, there are very strict kinds of conventions that have governed who eats with whom. And these conventions were applied by Hindus among themselves, not just with respect to Muslims. All right? But when you see a scene like this, you have to stop and think to yourself what is really going on. Because these are the marks by which these social classes are marked out and how differentiations are made within these communities. Okay? That's the significance because otherwise you, you would lose sight of what is really going on in something like this. All right. Now, so how does the film progress? We know how it progresses that, of course, you know, uh, 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 Javed and uh, Bano, they are going to get married and then, you know, she gets pregnant uh, and then you get the falling down the stairs scene. This is kind of a gone with the wind scene, you know, uh, if I may put it this way. Yeah, there have been quite a few films where a pregnant woman falls down the stairway and then the child is aborted. You know, this is like a minor tropos in cinema, uh, okay? Um, and of course, in the Hindi film, you have to sort of uh, dramatize it a bit more because then not only does she lose a child, but she can never have a child again, you know, right? Okay, you know, that, that's part of the plot. Um, it had to be that way, of course, you know. First time I saw this film, even when I knew, when she had fallen down, I knew. I hadn't read a thing, I knew what was going to happen exactly, you know, all right? So you just have to know sort of the tropos that it's going to follow. Um, which is important because, you see, elements of predictability can be actually interesting. I'm making a different point here. You know that people very often uh, sort of think about, well, you know, what's new? Why does everything have to be new? And what's new anyhow? It's actually the element of predictability sometimes that can make something interesting. The question is, what's done with it? You know, all right? So, uh, you know, she gets, she falls down, she can't have a child, the leap, she wants kind of the leap back, and Javed, so there's a little patriarchal element here. Man is kind of like the man, person of wisdom. You know, no, no, telling his wife, no, no, it's not proper to take the leap back from them. You know, the leap has been gifted to them in a way, um, and you know, so what do they do? They go away. Then they come back. It's now early 1947. Independence has not arrived yet. This is 1947, it says, but this is not August 15th, 1947, independence and after. This is before. It's before. Because there's still, the Union Jack is still up there. Uh, notice the lowering and uh, raising of the flag. Right? These are scenes, again, which should take you back to films like Pura or Paschim. Again, these are elements which uh, help us locate the film within a film history, too. You just don't locate it within the history of the nation. You don't just locate it within the narrative of nationalism. You locate it within film history. And remember, I want to, this is where, this is a course about film, too, that just as books cite other books, films, cite other films. You have to know how to detect, okay, the clues. You know, yes, last night I watched a film called Get Out. Some of you may have seen it, you know. It's presented in some places as a film about interracial relations. It's a horror story, frankly, you know, uh, that's what it is. It's a horror story, but if you've ever seen Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, this film just borrows elements 
it borrows elements very clearly with the opening line about a maze because if you have seen the shining it ends with a maze you know so what films do is they they cite other films and you don't know that until you know cinematic history you know uh, uh, if you see slumdog millionaire okay uh, has anyone here seen slumdog millionaire a few of you it quotes at least 10 amitabh bachchan films at least 10 I can take you to scenes from there and then I can show you exactly where it's citing another film with Amitabh Bachchan in it, including scenes from Diwar. It's actually quoting, you know, scenes from that. And this is what this film is doing. It's quoting certain scenes from certain films, which we know there is a template and that's what later films are doing as well. All right. So that's how the plot progresses. And then, of course, we get to sort of what you might call the second half of the film. Um, the second half is, uh, this you would have noticed again as a common technique. Uh, the films were not picked for these techniques, that, but they happened to be in so many of them. So it, it happened in Divar, right? It happened in Mother India. The little boy and the next thing you know, you know, they're six feet tall, strapping young men, you know, right? Okay, and here, the leap, the 1927, then it's... 25 then it's 47 they come back and now the leap is sitting in this yogi position that's the first scene where you see him in the second half he's seated in his room he's meditating he's got the thread you know he's now this figure of hindu nationalism you know the but the the scene is very interesting because it shows him in this posture as a yogi almost okay let's see if i can find that for you Um, just give me a second, I'm going to try to find that scene. So here he is going to be killed. Yeah, okay. So now we're moving into the um, the second half. And I want to, I'm, I'm looking for the scene. I had jotted it down, but somehow I can't. I at 127.44. It's just coming now. Okay. It'll come in 15 seconds. There. See, this is the first time you see him. Equanimity. I mean, it's like the Buddha, yeah? And you have to be able to comment on that. Why? Because every other scene almost in which he's shown, the man's in a rage, almost. He's marching up and down, you know, this, that, burn their houses, do this, do that. And then I say to myself, so what good did all this meditation do to you, you know? Right? <laughs> Isn't it interesting? I mean, you know, right? he's sitting there in equipoise and still silent. Go within yourself. Right? And you say, damn it, man. You didn't learn a thing from all of this. You know? Because you're just full of rage and all of that. And the ones who are not meditating are the ones who are very calm and, you know, humanist. Interesting. Right? This itself, you see, this is how, this is what it means to do interpretation. And you think yourself that the filmmaker doesn't have to make an explicit statement. He is making a kind of a, you know, that there is something fake about this guy. That, and this is, it's, it's not just that he's saying things and that he's actually, things he's saying lead to religious hatred. It does, right? And that, Human lives don't matter to people like him. But I'm saying, even without all of that, you think about the first time you're introduced to the grown-up Dilip. You know, the first time you're introduced to him. And then when you begin to juxtapose this with all the other scenes that are going to come in its wake, you begin to understand that this man is a, a complete hoax. 
you know, what is his conception of religion, right? It's some kind of empty conception, frankly, of religion altogether. And, there, and he's the one who's constantly making these invocations, by the way, to, to blood uh, and so forth and so on. All right. Uh, now, um, we're, we're out of time. There's a couple more scenes I want to see, but we'll save these for uh, today's Thursday, right? Yeah, uh, next Tuesday. We'll save them for Tuesday. Uh, and uh, just so that you know, I mean, I think I've mentioned this in class before. I'll return your uh, papers to you, by the way. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, Thursday of week nine. So that's two weeks from today. There's no class. But otherwise, we're just continue along. And so, you know, in the syllabus, you just have to <coughs> figure it out that, you know, we're now at the end of week seven. We move to week eight. Uh, whatever is on week eight, I think... Uh, uh, week eight is, I think, the film on Gandhi, uh, Munabai, you know, so that's what we're going to do, okay? All right, you can take your papers from me.